Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on Air, but first, the daily contemplation. Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha, consummated in knowledge and behavior, totally transcended, expert in all dimensions, knower of all worlds, unsurpassable trainer of those who can be tamed, both teacher and guide of gods as well as of humans, blessed, exalted, awakened, and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha. Perfectly formulated is this Buddha Dhamma, visible right here and now, immediately effective, timeless, inviting each and every one to come and see for themselves, inspect, examine, and verify, leading each and every one through progress towards perfection, directly observable, experienceable, and realizable by each intelligence, perfectly training is this noble Sangha community of the Buddha's noble disciples. They are training the right way, the true way, the good way, the direct way. Therefore do these eight kind of individuals, these four noble pairs, deserve both gifts, self-sacrifice, offerings, hospitality, and reverence or salutation, the joint palms. Since this noble Sangha community of the Buddhist noble disciples is an unsurpassable and in, indeed forever unsurpassed field of merit in this world, for this world, to honor, respect, support, uphold, and protect. Thank you. Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on Air number 45 recorded on the 19th of November, the year 2016, on planet Earth, on Knuckles Mountain, in the Cypress Hermitage indoor, because there fell 150 millimeters of rain during the night, and it's still raining. It good, it's very good for the hydropower, so I have hydropower and solar power here. So all this Dhamma is made without any pollution of fossil fuel. The solar panel plant you see here. And the hydropower here. So the water is very good for hydropower. Now the small hydropower turbine runs with approximately one kilowatt, thousand watt. And that's more than enough for this small Bhavana Kutti, this small meditation hut, even for video production. There are four questions and one simile, but first, the usual intro. 
نعم تسو بكباتو ارهاتو سما سمبوتاس ويلي انابو and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha. The simile uh, which I've taken from Helmut Hegel's book, Similes of the Buddha, uh, which also refers to the Tipitaka, is uh, called the simile of the vipers, the poisonous vipers. And it comes from Samyutta Nikaya, uh, book 35, on the six senses. And it's Sutta number 238, speech number 238. And it goes like this. There's a man, and he don't want to die. He, he, he don't want su suffering. He wants happiness. Uh, but then they tell him, ah, good man, uh, there's four poisonous vipers, snakes, with deadly venom in their glands and teeth. And they're after you. Do now what you seem suitable. And then, of course, he, he, he starts to, to run away. But then they say, ah, they tell him, ah, good man, there's uh, five serial killers after you with weapons ready, and they, they want to kill you right on the spot. Do now what you seem suitable. And then he uh, runs to and fro even more, panic in more panic than before ah they say ah good man there's one more message there there's a treacherous murderer after you also he's one of your intimate and dear friends and then the man he becomes even more confused and run even more to and fro and up and down and he, he don't know what to do then he runs by chance into an empty village and in this empty village, he enters all these empty houses. And whatever pots he finds, uh, these, these pots and vessels, they're empty. And there's nothing in them. So they say, ah, good man. You know, this village, it will be robbed by robbers. So you have to leave this village. You have to leave this village. Then he run out the village. Then he come to a great expanse of water. He cannot see the other side. But he know on the other side, there are all these dangers that are coming up from behind. He will be safe from these dangers. So he gathers what he can of grass and timber and uh, reeds and binds itself together. And then he throws it into water and thrusts himself headlong onto this raft and work with hands and feet until he comes to the other side to the far shore. There he goes up on dry land and stands high on dry land. So the Buddha, he said, uh, I've told you because this simile of the vipers and the meaning, atta, the significance of this simile is like this. The four vipers they signify or symbolizes the four great elements which Buddhist matter or materiality is made out of, namely solidity, fluidity, heat, and motion. And so, like they say to this man that these vipers he has to take care of, these vipers, these four vipers, he has to nurse them, he has to give them food and wash them and Put them to sleep at night, just like do you have to give this body food and wash it and put it to sleep at night. So we also has to do with these four vipers. But they they can bite him at any time. Then he will drop it on the spot after a very painful period. So also this body, it can die any time. You can have a heart attack or get cancer or have a traffic accident, and nobody watching this video know whether they will be alive in five minutes time or tomorrow or in two seconds time 
so dangerous, is it? So dangerous, is it, to have a body and to be dependent upon body? To be dependent upon solidity, fluidity, heat and motion, which is the materiality the body is made of. So it's like four wipers. Then this, this is the five robbers, the five serial killers that are after him, that have killed him so many times in samsara that it cannot be counted. This signifies the five clusters of clinging, the khandas, form, feeling, perception, mental construction, and consciousness. They are after him with swords up in the air. As soon as they see him, they chop off his head. So if you fall in love with this form, whether internal or external, whether own or others, with this feeling, pleasant, painful or neutral, with this perception, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking and having mental state, and this consciousness itself, and mental construction such as hoping, planning, intending, well then the, you are as is in the same situation as a man who is tracked down by five serial killers with their swords up in the air. Then there's this dear friend, the last killer, that also is tracking him down. It's desire and delight. The Buddha said, desire and delight. Because this, it is this desire and delight in things, repeatedly over a long period of time, and then habitually, that if there is this desire for life, and for sensing, and delight in life, and delight in sensing, at the moment of death, what, then one comes back and get a new body, according to one's karma. Getting a new body it means getting a new death, means inevitably getting new aging, sickness, and death. Inevitably means getting new suffering. And therefore, this, the Buddha, he told this simile of this treasure's dear and intimate friend, delight and desire. Because it's one who keeps killing one. It's a smiling killer who kills you. you he smiles to you, you walk right up within two, and then he stabs you down again and again and again. Desire and delight. Then this is empty village. What does that signify? Yeah, it signifies the senses. The ability to see, smell, taste, hear, touch, and think and have mental states. Why is it empty? Because it's empty of happiness. Because it's empty of self. Because it's empty of entity because it's empty of permanence, because it's empty of safety. That's why the senses, these addictive instruments or sensors we are endowed with, that's why they are empty. First of all, because they're empty of happiness. What then with these empty pots? This is the external sense object. Whatever you can see, visible forms and color, smells, tastes, touches, and mental states, they are also empty. There's, it's like an empty pot, there's nothing in them. There's no meaning in them, there's no happiness in them, no lasting happiness in them. There's no substance in them. There's no permanence in them. Therefore, they are like empty pots. What then are these uh, robbers? They they will come and attack. Yeah, this can also be symbolized as these six inter six six inter external sense objects. That is something that you can see because the eye is attacked by visual forms, agreeable as disagreeable. And so also by the other senses. The mind and the body is attacked by their sense object, whether agreeable or disagreeable. It cannot say no to sensing them. 
They just come and knock the door. The sin stores, the five, the six sin stores. So they are like these robbers that are coming to attack the village and that, that you have to flee from. This is anything that can be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, thought of, and makes a state and one can endure. What then is this, this great expanse of water one has to cross? This is the flood of sensuality, the four floods, the flood of sensuality, of sensing, being in world about in this, sensing this and that, being captivating by this and that, and repulsed by this and that. It's kind of like a flood. It's flooding in our mind and flushing it down into more sensing. It's a flood of ignorance. It's a flood of becoming, becoming this and that. And it's a flood of views, of having this or that opinion, then giving up this opinion because it's obviously wrong, and then taking up a new opinion, and then examining this, going around two, five, six lives with that opinion, then taking up a new opinion, new opinion, new opinion. So this sensing sensuality, these views, opinions, these becomings, this and that, and this ignorance, this not seeing, this not knowing, is flooding in my mind. It fills it up and flushes it down. The samsaric river of suffering. What's in this raft you make? This signifies this noble eightfold way. Atangika makka, Arya makka which is right view, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right awareness, and right concentration. Dig those friends. Memorize them. Get the definitions right. This is the raft. This is the raft to deathlessness, the other side. This deathlessness, this only lasting happiness to be found anywhere, is signifying dry land. Where when he comes up, it signifies the other. He stands high on dry land. So the whole Dhamma is in this short text uh, of two pages of the Samyutta Nikaya, you see the picture of here, which I can recommend buying or studying whatever that is on it, free on the internet. Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses, because there's some connections in them to each other. So much for the simile of the Vibers. Now we go to the questions. The first question is question 147. And it goes like this. How to control disadvantageous thoughts according to Buddhism? A disadvantageous thoughts, detrimental thoughts, are thoughts that are mixed with or based upon or related to either ignorance or derivatives thereof such as doubt, confusion, not knowing, hesitation, or greed, such as desire, lust, craving, or hate, such as aversion, irritation, opposition, mental rigidity. If the thought and thinking is mixed with either one of these or all three roots, bad roots, evil roots, namely ignorance, greed, and hate, then it's disadvantageous thinking, disadvantageous thoughts, akusaya. So they are also distracting, of course, very distracting. They, they come in and stay in the mind, and one cannot come out of them without noticing them. So all these uh, 
advices the Buddha gave on how to come out of these distracting thoughts, which is in the Vitaka Vijara Sutta, which is also in the Samyutta Nikaya. No, it's Madhima Nikaya, uh, number 20, Madhima Nikaya, which is a picture of here. Vitaka Santana Sutta, how to removal of the distracting thoughts. Uh, all these advices are based on one is aware of it, one is aware of the thinking. So this awareness is mind seeing mind. If mind doesn't see mind, then the thought and the thinking can go on. Both advantageous, advantage, disadvantageous and neutral thinking can go on and on and on for billions of years without the mind seeing it, noticing it, being aware of it. Then, of course, it cannot escape it. No, no chance. So first one has to see, the mind has to look itself in the mirror and see what is it doing? What is it doing now? And then classify, is there any hate there? Is there any greed there? Is there any ignorance there? And if it realizes that, ah, there is, there is either greed, hate, or ignorance present or derivatives thereof, then there are specific antidotes. And then they, they go like this. The first advice the Buddha gave, which was to redirect the mind away from an, an object which caused a disadvantageous thinking towards an advantageous object. So let's say that it's an object that causes greed, or it's an object that causes hate, or it's an object that causes confusion, and one can redirect direct mind to another object, for example, the Buddha, the Dhamma, or the Sangha, or meditation. Uh, then immediately these disadvantageous thoughts say disappear. It's like you have a piece of wood, and then there's a then there's a, a pig inside the piece of wood. You have to get out, but you cannot get it out. It's it's stuck in there. This signifies a disadvantageous thought. It's stuck inside the mind, which is a piece of wood. Then you take a finer pick, a small pick, and then you can hammer it in under the coarse pick, and then they get the coarse pick out. So you take a fine pick to get the coarse pick out of the piece of wood. So the coarse pick signifies the detrimental thinking, and the fine pick signifies the redirecting of mind to an ad ad advantageous object of thinking. Desire for living forms, sexual desire typically, they can be uh, exchanged with thinking about a disgusting, rotting corpse, then the greed will go away. Desire for inanimate things like cars, money, food, houses, uh, anything that can be owned, owned, or belongings, they can be exchanged by thinking about their impermanence, that they don't last. Desire for them can be exchanged by this, noting the, their impermanence, these inanimate things. Aversion towards living beings, this can be exchanged by thinking about the release by universal friendliness, the release of mind. Metta cetu vimuti, the release of mind by universal friendliness. An aversion towards inanimate things by noting their composition, that they are only made out of, for example, a knife, if you have aversion towards a knife, or a television, or a, mu a piece of music, or anything else, then one can note their composition, are they are made only of this not lasting, compounded, solidity, fluidity, heat, and motion, if that is a material object. Delusion, doubt, and uncertainty, confusion, 
it can be exchanged by thorough investigation. So if one notices others' is confusion, there's doubt, then one examines the object, or examines the thing. Then there's doubt, ignorance, hesitation, uncertainty. Confusion will evaporate as a cause of this examination, this, this scrutiny, this turning the object around and seeing it from all sides and noting its causality, what's causing this phenomenon to arise and what sees it is. And what does it affect itself? What causality does it have itself? If this object I'm thinking about is in existence, what does it, what consequences does it have? And what causes, causes it to come into being? So this is the first method, there are five methods. This was redirecting attention to a different advantageous object. Method two is to consider the danger in, in thoughts mixed with hate, greed and ignorance. These thoughts are of mine. They are disgusting, dangerous, bringing much misery now and later. Just like a young man or woman is disgusted and humiliated if somebody hangs a rotting carcass of a snake or a dog or a human around their neck. So should one regard this dis disturbing distraction. Very, very acute, huh? Imagine having a, a, a corpse of a rotten dog or even human being or snake hanging around your neck. The stench of that. So one should consider the danger of having thoughts mixed with greed, hate and ignorance. And if one remembers this, this necklace of a rotting corpse, then these thoughts will evaporate instantly. If they, they, they doesn't, after these two methods, exchanging or uh, considering the danger in them, then one can go further on to, to uh, method three, which is stopping all flow of thought by non-attention and non-reflection. It's like a man he doesn't wish to see, then he closes his eyes. So you can say it's like non-attention, it's like closing the eyes of the mind. Cut. Stop. Don't pay attention to that. The fourth method is repeated reflection on the root cause of these distractions. Uh, so searching for a reason behind these mental afflictions can itself cure them. It's like a, a, a man, he's running, then he wishes to find calm. Then he, he's finding no reason to run. Like no reason to think. So he starts walking instead. So after a while he finds no reason to walk, then he sits down. Then after a while after he sits down, then he finds no reason to sit down, then he lies down. If I, so he's cured, now he's happy, he's lying down and calm. Same thing with the thought. I think, why is, am I thinking this thought? Is it necessary to think this thought? And then instead of running along the thought pathway, then one starts walking, then sitting, and eventually lying. And then the, the thought, the thinking, this distracting thinking has gone away. It has been stilled gradually and silenced and eventually stopped. The fifth method is beating mind down with mind. It beating the evil mind down with the force of the good mind by clenching the lower teeth against the upper teeth, or by pressing the tongue up against the palate, like a strong man holds down a, a weak man by the shoulders. So should one beat down mind with mind. Then these evil, ill and detrimental thoughts rooted in greed, hate and ignorance are eliminated and they vanish. By their evaporation, mind settles down become focused, concentrated, and unified on the purely good thought and thinking only.
These are the five methods the Buddha recommended. And I, I'll place a bet on if one goes through these five methods, then there is no detrimental evil thinking or thought that can survive coming through these five methods. But one has to be aware of them, notice them by mind seeing mind. If one doesn't notice, then this attention deficit that instantly occurs, it occurs whenever following after these distractions, whether they are based on lust and greed, or whether they're based on aversion, or whether they're based on confusion, or it's following after them, then the attention deficit, mind not seeing mind, this occurs instantly. And right there, one is, so to speak, lost. Because then one has no control whatsoever over one's own mind. It is running after greed. It's running after hate. It's running after ignorance. And by that, greed, hate, and ignorance grow. And that will cause suffering in the future for that mind. Definitely, by accumulation. Again, this, the source of this is the moderate speech of the Buddha, Majjhima Nikaya, number 20. The removal of distracting thoughts, Vitaka Santana Sutta. And I'll give the link below to the full text. They are well translated by Soma Thera, a Sri Lankan monk who went to Germany. And there's also a Dhamma drop on my website, whatbuddhasit.net, on how to remove distracting thoughts. Just so that. Distracting thoughts, search for that. So much for question 147. Question 148 goes like this. Is choosing to watch TV at a, a TV show instead of Dhamma disadvantageous? Indeed, yes. Indeed, yes. Uh, why so? Yeah, because it's not connected with the goal of attaining Nibbana. Neither is it connected with approaching Nibbana. And Nibbana is the only lasting happiness. So you can say uh, anything not connected with that is connected with either stagnation where one is or moving away from Nibbana, moving away from lasting happiness that is moving more and more into the jungle of suffering, the samsaric jungle of suffering. So it's kind of like a pointless uh, activity. It, it, it serves no purpose. Uh, it's just empty uh, entertainment. The Buddha, he would say that there are many kind of pointless talk and uh, TV shows, uh, they are definitely pointless talk, pointless activity. They will display what he called as pointless talk, uh, not which also covers such, such a things as news and politics. He said such talk as on kings, robbers, ministers, armies, dangers, wars, food, drinks, clothing, furniture, jewelry, cosmetics, relatives, vehicles, villages, town, cities, countries, women, heroes, places, amusements, the dead, trifles, the origin of the world, the origin of the sea, whether metaphysical things are like this or are not like this, such talk is pointless. It's irrelevant. It is detrimental. It is empty of any advantage. Empty of any advantage. So they could be neutral, but TV shows are I would say even detrimental is, is akusala. It's not kusala, it's akusala, detrimental. Why so? Because it's habitual stupidification. Uh, so one should uh, turn off this TV. Modern man, uh, uh, according to recent uh, surveys, looks, uh, sits in front of this TV screen two and a half hours a day for the most of Europe, and for USA, it's eight and a half hours a day. Especially when there's a, a House of Cards, a special a TV series on, which goes on for 13 hours uh, in a row. Eight and a half hours. This is a full working day in front of a TV screen. 
So this is TV addiction. So since this is an addiction that leads to laziness, both of the body and the mind, which become heavy and thick and ugly and habitually thinking the same thing as the one who makes these TV shows and make this TV. And it's worth noticing then that uh, those who make TV, this is a, a journalist, they are uh, usually people that with a kind of like middle size education. It's not uh, regarded, they don't have a university degree or anything like that. They went through college, yes, that's true. But not, and then three years more, but not more than that. And so if you take food, information food, from such a source again and again, which is based on ratings, which is popular, and this drags the level even further down, below the middle level. So uh, it is a stupidification, because it leads to something that is below medium level of intelligence. That's a comic uh, result. A lower than 100 IQ in a future life, if one is reborn as a human. Then there are 10 advantageous subjects that can be, whether that there are advantageous whether you talk about them or you think about them or you see them in a TV or you see them on the internet. They are talk on the modesty of having few wants. Talk on the bliss of contentment. Talk on the joy of seclusion. Talk on the ease of disentanglement. Talk on the energy of enthusiasm. Talk on the advantage of morality. Talk on the calm of concentration. Talk on the insight of understanding. Talk on the freedom of release. Talk on direct knowledge and vision of relief. This is a 10 advantageous kusala objects, which can be recommended turning back to and then uh, turning off this TV and ditching it. Throw it out. Get rid of it. It's not even not worth a dime. It is detrimental. It's disadvantageous, both in the short run and, or on the long run. Whether you are a kid, a, a youngster, a teenager, a middle age, or old, it is addictive. It's habitual waste of time. So, uh, TV or TV shows are not to be recommended, seen from a Buddhist point of view and the long-term prognosis of any sentient being who are looking for happiness. So much for TV shows. Question 149 goes like this. How does the Buddhist and the Bodhisattvas, which is Buddhist to be, uh, Buddhists in space, uh, those who will become Buddhists later on, how do they emerge? Yes, they make a determination. So. They are very, 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 very rare because there has to be a number of conditions, eight conditions fulfilled when they make this determination to become a Buddha. Why do they make this determination to become a Buddha? Because they know they can save themselves and go to Nibbana themselves, but they, want, they don't want it to be private. Then they only save themselves. So they want to save others also. So they, they do this for the welfare and happiness of all beings. They delay their own enlightenment in order that other beings can be enlightened also. And this is not, uh, this is not something that many people do because they will have to go through a minimum of four asankayas and 100,000 universal cycles before reaching this goal. And they could reach Nibbana in their life, they make this determination. They have it to do it in front of another Buddha. So they had to make the wish, may I become a Buddha, and 
tell this wish to the, while bowing down to the feet of another Buddha. Buddha Gautama, the last Buddha, he did it when he was a young uh, ascetic. He came flying through the air uh, with bark cloth rustling in the wind. When he saw somebody make a uh, road nice with flowers and so on, and then he descended and asked why they make this road nice. And then they say, don't you know, uh, Buddha Dipankara, he is coming along this way. Therefore, we are making the rose nice with, with hanging flowers and so on. And then he said, I, please give me a, a piece of road also, so I will make this road also nice. Then he got a small mud pool where there was uh, some water pool, pools. And then uh, he, he, when Buddha Dipankara came, then he lied down in the mud pool and then said, please show it. You can use me as a bridge. And then Dipankara saw, saw, surely, surely, this is a Buddha sprout, a Buddha sprout, a Buddha to be. And then he foretold Sumedha, who later, much later, became the Buddha, Gautama, what his, his, that he would be a Buddha in so and so many uh, universal cycles. And his father will be this name, his mother will be this name, his castles and his horse, and his wife and his son will be this and that name. So he foretold him the whole, his whole life by seeing it in the future. These conditions uh, that should be uh, fulfilled for this wish to become a Sammasambuddha, they are as follows. They are it. One should be a, a human being. Two, one should be a male. Three, one should be sufficiently developed to become an arahat at that very birth, at that very moment. And Sumedha was. One should be a recluse at the time of the declaration. One should uh, declare this resolve, this determination, this wish before another Samasambuddha. One should be uh, uh, possessed of uh, the attainment such as jhanas, jhana meditations. One should be prepared to sacrifice all, even one's own life. And one should be, one's resolution should be absolutely firm and unwavering. I'll give two links below to the explanation about the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas. So you can go and follow up on it there, where all the references about uh, these facts are given in the text. Then after that, uh, Buddha Dipankara went first, and then uh, Sumedha, he sat down and then he thought about ah, what, what are these ten perfections I have to perfect before I can become a Buddha. And then he realized that there were these ten perfections, these dasa parami, ten perfections, that he has to uh, perfect to the third degree. If we take the first one, a dana parami, the perfection of giving or generosity, then a normal savakka bodhis, those who become enlightened by discipleship, they give away their possessions. And number two, to the third, uh, second degree is by the Pachik Buddhas, they give away a limb, an organ, or an eye, or, or a kidney, or whatever. But to the third degree, then they give away. And this is to the Bodhisattvas of the Samas and Buddhas, they give away their own life. In the Buddha Gautama's uh, case, this was fulfilled when he was a hare, uh, like a rabbit, a hare. And then there came a Brahmin, a recluse, and he needed food. And then this hare, which has some other animal friends in the forest, he went up to this Brahmin. And then the Brahmin, he has made a, a, a forest, a fire in the forest. And then the hare, he jumped into uh, the fire. So he roasted, died, and roasted up so, so the recluse could have food. And it's said that from, from that time on, there is a hare in the, in the moon sign that will uh, persist in this universal cycle out. And you can see in many uh, places, there's this moon sign, then you can see a small hair inside, uh, in Buddhist uh, symbolism and, and pictures from ancient days. And this is one of these Jataka stories of which says 547. And this was where he perfected his dasa, 
his first perfection, the perfection of generosity, by giving his own life to this particular wandering recluse who needed food. So he made himself a roasted hare by jumping into a fire. He gave also his life away at another, in another occasion where he was a human being wandering together with two friends. And then they saw a, a tiger uh, that has two pups, but couldn't feed them because it was a famine. And then he said to his friends, ah, you can go back. Uh, I stay out here in the forest. And then uh, he went back to the tiger uh, mom and lied down so she could eat him, but she wouldn't uh, eat him. She wouldn't kill him. Then he took a, a, a pin and made it sharp, and then he, he uh, pricked a hole in his body so his blood uh, flew out. Then the tiger licked up the blood, and eventually uh, he died from this bleeding, uh, and so the tiger ate his body. This is friends, they saw that and reported that. Uh, so, so he gave his life up uh, in more than one instance. This gives an impression that these bodhisattvas, they are special beings. In, they are altruistic in a way that is diff difficult to comprehend. How far they will go in order to serve others, to serve his own. How far they will go. And therefore they are so rare, because it is very rare and very few people very, very, very few people that will go as far as giving their own life away. So this ten perfection is uh, first dasa parami is uh, dana parami, generosity. Second perfection is morality, sila. Third perfection is withdrawal, nikamma. Fourth perfection is understanding, panya. Then energy, enthusiasm, virya. Then tolerance, patience, endurance, kanti. Then truthfulness, honesty, satya, parami. Then determination, resolution, atitana, parami. Then friendliness and goodwill, metta, parami. Then upekka and indifference, imperturbability, the perfection of mind by that, upekka, parami. So he realized that, and then they perfect them, and it t this takes m uh, many, many years, universal cycles, hundreds of thousands of lives as uh, animals. They cannot be smaller than a, a quail, a small bird, or larger than an elephant, uh, if they're born as animal, as human, and uh, as deva, and so on. They, they work on perfecting that. They always have special intention a set of intentions they also perfect. That they, they intend withdraw, they intend not in, to enroll, not entanglement. They intend seclusion. They are in, intent on non greed. They are intent on non hate. They are intent on non ignorance. And they are intent on escape. So, this special set of intention, which are, they are not conscious about it all these lives, but it's still driving them along towards this Buddhahood, which happens much later. They also make five great sacrifices. Uh, they give up wife, children, kingdom, life, and limb. Uh, the most famous is uh, uh, the last Jataka is Vishantara Jataka, where he gives up uh, all of them and then gives them back later on. And uh, I can give a link below to Vishantara Jataka, where he gives his wife away and his two children and his horses and his kingdom and so on. And then in the end, he gets them all back. He must also fulfill three kinds of behavior. This is striving to help. Striving to help and striving to save the world, number two, and striving for Buddhahood. This is these, these three strivings. Then they, their career from this determination point in front of a Buddha, until they become Buddha, it can vary. And this is 
according to their abilities. Gautama, he had the shortest career. This is four asankhyas, four incalculable periods, and then 100,000 universal cycles. And an and incalculable period can, cannot be calculated. But the Buddha, he, he said it was like this. If one take a box that is eight by eight by eight kilometers, and then fill it up with sand, and so each sand is one universal cycle, then the period will be as long as that. There are saints in this box of eight by eight by eight kilometers. So this is a lot of uh, universal cycles, which are approximately uh, 150 billion years each. So they go through an immense amount of suffering in order to save others. And in each life of them, they could become enlightened themselves. But they delay in order to get to teach the Dhamma to others, just as I do today. This is was because uh, Gautama's strong side was Panya, his intelligence was exceedingly sharp. Those who has uh, faith, Sadda, as this goes by faith, they come to the same Sama some Buddhahood. But they come by different roads and take a little longer by go by faith. Uh, they have to go. Uh, they have to go eight asankhyas and hundred thousand eons. And those who go by enthusiasm, by energy, by, by virya, as the next Buddha, Buddha Mitsaya, Arya, Ajitta Mitsaya, the unconquerable friend, he will have succeeded sixteen. Asankhyas and 100,000 eons, when he comes forward to his Buddhahood. It is said that Metaya, he has been pupil under more than 10,000 Buddhas. More than 10,000 Buddhas he has been a, a pupil under. Compared to Buddha Gautama, he was pupil under 24 other Buddhas, which he met through his career, through these uh, four Asankhyas and 100,000 eons where Dipankara was the first. There was people under him, and then under the 24 Buddhas that passed in between in this, in this period, in this immensely long time, time period. In their penultimate life, in their life just before the life, they, they attain Buddhahood. They, they all live in the Tusita divine dimension. To see the means content among the contented devas. And there you live for 576 million years. And they will live a full life length there. And uh, usually have go around and pay worship to the former Buddhas and their relics with their wives. Mitya will be said to have five wives uh, of exceedingly beautiful. Before they uh, reach enlightenment, all the Bodhisattvas, they have five dreams. The first dream is that they dream that they, they, they lie with the world as a couch. They sleep on a couch that is the world, India. There's a picture here. Uh, with Himala Himalaya as a pillow and with the left hand uh, racing in the eastern sea and the right in the western and the feet in the ocean below India. The second dream is that there's a creeper, a kind of kusa grass that grows up from the navel all the way up to heaven, to the sky. And the third dream is that white worms with black heads creep up from the feet covering the knees. And the fourth dream is that the four birds of various colors, they come from the four sides and lands at their feet, and then they become white. And the fifth dream is that they walk back and forth on excrement without being soiled. And the interpretation of these dreams is that the, when they lie on the world with the Himalaya as a pillow, then it signifies that they are born into supreme enlightenment, that they are the best of the, the best, the best of beings 
not only on the human world, but on the, all the 31 levels of existence. The grass of Kiriya signifies a noble eightfold way, that they would rediscover the noble eightfold way that leaps upwards, up into the sky and beyond. The white worms uh, with black heads that uh, are creeping up to their knees, they signify all the lay people that come and uh, uh, go forth under them and thereby attain enlightenment. And the four birds uh, of various colors signifies two sets of four. The four castes that are in India and thereby, and also the four of the four people, kinds of people in the Sangha, namely the male and female uh, lay devotees, Upasikas and Upasakas, and the Bhikkhunis and the Bhikkhus, the monks and the nuns. These four societies is signified by the four different colored birds that all become white, become enlightened when they land at the feet of the Buddha. And that they walk off on, on a, a heap of excrement without it becoming dirty signifies that they will, uh, they will be giving them a lot of gifts. Uh, everything from uh, monasteries to robes to gold and silver to anything, food, but they will not be attached to it. They will not be soiled by it. So the Buddhists also often they say, say themselves that they arise in the world like a lotus in a mud pool. This goes for all nobles. The lotus in a mud pool, grow up in a mud pool, is a very dirty place, but the lotus itself blooms out without being affected by the dirt of the world. It goes, it's like going even over some uneven It's another saying. So, so is the, the arising of the, because there's a lot of conditions that has to be fulfilled. They are very rare, but nevertheless, there's an endless road back in time. Uh, we know something like uh, uh, six, seven, 27 is mentioned in the text, and in Mahayana text, there's more than hundreds. And then we know the names of the next 10. But this is an endless row of Buddhas, because there is very few, but there is some who make, make this determination. It's instead of just being enlightened themselves, then they say, hey, ho, wait a minute, then nobody will benefit from it. If I just go into the forest and become enlightened there and save myself, nobody will benefit from it. What now if I delay my own enlightenment in order to benefit others, to tell others about how to do it, how to develop the noble eightfold way, how to reach Nibbana, how to reach gain, deathlessness, and lasting happiness, how to do it. What now if I do that? And then they determine, they, they make this, this determination to do that, and they make this determination in front of another Buddha while these eight conditions are fulfilled. And then this, in itself, this intention, this very, very good intention, very big sacrifice, very big offer, because it, it means basically that they have to die as many times as you have to die in, at, in minimum four asankayas and 100,000 universal cycles. And that is billions of billions of billions of billions of times, as this and that being in this and that situation. So it's a great offer. It, it doesn't come bigger than that, this sacrifice. Despite the fact that they, call, they, they, call, they, they could go Nibbana at that very life, that they make their determination. They make the Bodhisattva whoa. I hope this answers the question about how the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, they emerge. Rare Allah in the world. Rare is it to see the Buddha. Rare is the Dhamma. Rare is it to be born in a period where there is a Dhamma. Therefore, we should feel urgency, some vega. Now, the Dhamma is here. The noble Eightfold Way is here. The books are there. The monks on the internet, they teach it on the YouTube. Huh? 
we should utilize this chance, this precious chance we have to approach Nibbana and to come in a situation where if we doesn't make the goal in this life, then we will do it in a future life. Because only that is safety. Question 150 goes like that. Ah, now we've done 150 questions. Not too bad. What is the meaning of to make more of something than actually is there. Yeah, this is a signifies a symbolic expression of what we call asava, which means can go both means liquor, but it can also mean fermentation, because uh, liquor alcohol is made by fermentation, huh? fermentation of sugar. Asava is can roughly be translated in the English language to assuming, supposing, imagining, expecting taking for granted, inferring, conceiving, thinking that something is like this and only this is true, or it is probably so, like that, but in lack of proof or certain knowledge of that is actually like that. There are uh, three of them, or four of them can be a different list, but uh, Three is most simple. That's the men mental fermentation joined with sensuality, with sensing. That's mental fermentation linked with becoming bhava. Bhava sava, those kama sava. And that's mental fermentation associated with ignorance. These are the three mental concoctions of fermentations, said the Buddha. The Noble Eightfold Way is to be developed for the direct experience of these three fermentations. For the full understanding of them, for their complete elimination, and for their final overcoming, abandoning, and leaving all behind. So, basically, it is, a fermentation can be uh, compared to like this. Is his mind making up something from some sense data? For example, one goes out to uh, the ocean side and or in a boat and a calm day, and then one sees around that the horizon is linear all around, way around. And then one assumes ah, I, the Earth is like a flat pancake. This is a fermentation. Because, for, first of all, if one took a, a, a very straight piece of metal and then put up and looked upon the horizon, horizon with one line, then we could see it was bending slightly. So the measurement, the observation is slightly faulty. That's one thing. But the second thing is that one assumes that then it must be around. I'm standing on a round flat pancake. Why there actually is another model of this geometry, and that is a very, very large sphere. And if a very, very small observer stand on a very large sphere, then it will look like a small pancake if he looks around. And that also goes for a camera. If you put a camera and turn it around, then it also will make the same observation from the data. So is this, this model of a flat pancake is not something that is in the sense data itself. It's something that mind assumes. It conceives it. It brews it up. It ferments it. The mental fermentation linked with sensuality, this is a false assumption that sensing always brings pleasure. Huh? Uh, which actually, sensing, does not always bring pressure. Sensing always also brings pain and neutral feeling. So this is just one thinks ah if I if I sensing then I sense all only pleasure. No, that's not the case. You also sense pain and neutral feeling. So this is the normal uh, fermentation of sensuality. The fermentation with the coming is like the banal yet common wishing, I may I become rich, beautiful, and famous, not noticing that any becoming inevitably is associated with change, with decay, death, and thus suffering. 
So it's a fermentation that one says, ah, if I just became this thing, a young, beautiful, rich, uh, successful, praised, famous, then I would be eternally happy. That's a fermentation. That's an assumption that mind brews up because it wants this thing. But this, this, even these states, fame, success, youth, richness, they are also impermanent. So the data, the assumption itself doesn't lead to the goal of lasting happiness. But this, the mind assumes, it ferments, it is like that. The mental uh, fermentation associated with ignorance uh, is misconception we make by inaccurate approximation, undue generalization, and overprojection. This is, for example, this case about uh, making the observation that the horizon is approximately flat, approximately flat, and then making this model, ah, it's a flat pancake. Earth is a flat pancake. One, can, one goes out to the edge, one can fall down. If, if you, there was a, a, a lady who raised up and uh, protested very strongly against this man uh, telling about that Earth was a globe, it was a sphere. Then he asked her, what, what is under the pancake? Uh, that, she, she said, that's a big, uh, that's a big turtle. Uh, but the, then he said, what's, what's under the turtle? And she, she became very, very angry and upset. And then yelled at him, it's turtles all the way down. She said to him, and then she left the room. So her worldview was a flat pancake. Right? She's seen this in the medieval book, huh? with a hold up by a big turtle, which was standing on an endless row of turtles an infinite row of turtles down. That's a very, very particular, uh, colorful and specific uh, and <laughs> grotesque and uh, baroque uh, mental fermentation. It's turtles all the way down. Don't you understand? Turtles all the way down. Just remember that. That's what mind can brew up to make an explanation. It's, mind is basically a set of neural networks. I work with this myself in uh, artificial neural networks in computers. And they have, they will just, if they see a, a set of data, then they make a prediction. It's never the case and don't make a prediction. And so also with mind. Whatever data set it sees, it'll make a prediction about what it is. Then come up with an explanation, form an opinion, and that's an assumption. Then if it falls in love with this opinion, I have this opinion, this is because I'm better than the others, then this opinion is not only an opinion, it's certain knowledge. And it, I, I should not be questioned whether it's turtles all the way down or not, because then I become angry and leave the room. <laughs> then this, this is a habit that neural networks has, and, and it is an inherent error in neural networks. They always make a prediction where you should not predict, huh? even when you should not predict anything. When the data are so uncertain, unsure, that you cannot make any certain prediction, then neural network will come with a prediction anyway. That will have significance 52%. Random is 50%. Huh? So it's very close to random what it will come out with. It's turtles all the way down. It's a big man called Goliath. And he's standing on another one called Goliath Cho, and then he's this is Goliaths all the way down, or similar uh, models, which is very fancy, very colorful, and also look very captivating, but it's not exactly like that. This is the mental fermentation. This is putting more into it than is actually is there. The flat horizon. The approximately flat horizon is there. That the sense data is there, but the model is not there. The pancake Earth model is not there. It's in the sense data. It's only a particular perspective on 
particular perception, a particular data set, but it doesn't lead unambiguously to only one model. There are many models that could be that could be explained from these same data. The typical uh, fermentations that mind misconceives is the following. So mind misconstrues and misconceives the relations between the sense data and other sense data, other experiences, memories and like that, and thus misunderstands. Notably, mind ferments the three universal characteristics into the opposites. The three universal characteristics, Tilla Kana is one, impermanence, Anicca, two, suffering, Dukkha, and three, Anatta, no self. But the mind misconceives what actually is impermanent as it was lasting. So we think, ah, this body, I can keep this body for so and so long. I can keep this house, this car, this wife, these children, this job. I can keep it because it's, it lasts. It doesn't notice that how long it lasts. And if it notices, then it will have fear of that it doesn't last. And this fear, if one is aware of it, then it's advantageous, then it will lead towards, towards Nirvana. If one is not aware of it, then one will go around being a little bit anxious about losing the job, losing the wife, losing the children, losing the reputation, losing the bank account. Uh, losing whatever one think is permanent. So might misconstrues things that are impermanent as if they were permanent. And thereby it makes sense to desire them, to want them, to want to have them, to want to be able to have them and enjoy them all the time and thereby cling to them, put them inside the cupboard or the safe with a code on it. Even inside there, they evaporate, they disappear by themselves, due to impermanence. Because you, you, impermanence is a universal characteristic of all worldly phenomena, material as immaterial, past, present, and future, live or dead. Mind misunderstands also that ultimately everything is suffering because it is this, that, that has this act aspect of impermanent, impermanence. It misunderstands it that what ultimately is suffering, that that is happiness, that can be happiness, that the body can be happiness, that the life can be happiness, ultimately speaking, because it forgets about this impermanence. So for, it makes first one fermentation, it ferments what is impermanent, as it were permanent. And then it jumps on it and wants it. And then say, ah, it's lasting happiness. As, because then I can keep it. But if you become happy for something that you lose, then whatever you become happy from, then you will become unhappy because you will always lose it because it's always impermanent. The more happy you become for it, the more unhappy you become for it when you lose it. So all worldly objects, states, phenomena, are ultimately speaking suffering because they are impermanent. Where they cause pleasant feeling uh, 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 initially or not, doesn't matter. Actually, it is so. It's a catch-22 situation. If they cause a lot of happiness, a lot of pleasant feeling while they come, then they also call, cause a lot of suffering while, when they go. And they always go down the drain of impermanence. They always go. It's an absolute fact. Mind misunderstands us what fundamentally is impersonal as something that is me, mine, what I am, and myself. So it misunderstands body, feeling, perception, mental construction and consciousness 
as my, me, mine, what I am or what I am made of. And then it starts clings to that. That's egoism in a nutshell. And that causes suffering because you will lose the body, obviously. You also lose the feeling, the perception, the experience, the mental construction, the hoping, the intending, and consciousness itself from one moment to the next moment. So there's nothing in there that can be myself. But nevertheless, most being ferments this as there is a self. And this self is these forms, bodies, feelings, perceptions, mental constructions, and consciousness. And it makes sense to cling to them. Because since I can keep them, because they are lasting, then they can infer lasting happiness. That's a fermentation. That's like the pancake earth model. And that's the game plan of most beings in samsara. That, that, that is possible. It's a fermentation that actually goes wrong and uh, goes havoc already at the point of not noting impermanence, Anicca. If you note impermanence, then it is very easy to see that this cannot lead to lasting happiness. And since it cannot lead to lasting happiness, uh, it's impermanent, it's evaporating by itself, then it cannot be identical to itself, then it cannot be an identity, then it cannot be an I, me, or mine. And since you cannot keep it, it cannot be mine. In any case, whatsoever. I'll place a link below to, I have a, a small Dhamma drop on uh, my website called the Three Fermentations. Asava, mental fermentation. And Arahat, and that's uh, the only Apidna, the direct knowledge of which also counts as flying, elevating and swimming inside the uh, cement and cliff and going through walls and so on. Uh, escaping the fermentations and seeing them as fermentations. This is the Buddha, uh, he regarded as the only really valuable apinna of the mystical tricks. This is seeing these three fermentations as fermentations and eliminating them. And that eliminating all the three fermentations is equals enlightenment. It happens at the moment of awakening that these three fermentations, these tendencies to assume, to suppose, to infer, to conjecture, to spin up some explanation that is not correct, that is not according to fact, that is not according to absolute reality. This, these first evaporate to the complete degree at the moment of awakening at the moment of Bodhi, at the moment of enlightenment. So one should, this mind seeing mind should always be a little suspicious. If mind forms an opinion little too quickly, huh? Drag the gun, boom, it's like this and that. No, 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 no. Examine first. Then examine again. Then remodel the opinion. Then examine again according to that. Don't jump into the hole of conclusion too quickly. Be very careful, very suspicious towards any of these ideas, funny ideas that mind has. For example, that there's something that is I, me, mine. That Lasting happiness is possible in this or in any other world or in any other future. All one can bend the world, shape it, plan it, construe it, so it will infer lasting happiness. Or that there is anything as much as an atom in this world or in any other world that is lasting, that is trustable, that is safe. As soon as you start going along these lines with these funny ideas, which is not very funny because they entail death, 
repeated aging sickness and death in an endless row. So they're not very funny. It's, it's very tragic, actually, to have these ideas. But it takes only a, a second. Then you have built your whole life, your whole thinking, your whole planning upon ideas and assumptions on mental fermentations such as these. Be careful. Be suspicious. Don't assume anything. Lastly, I say thank you to the supporters once again, both the regular supporters, the occasional donors, and those three persons who gave food uh, here the last week. Please remember to subscribe down there if you want to go to the website or if you want to support this uh, Dharma sharing, then click hover with your mouse over in this corner here, then the small eye will appear, click the I and drag down, then there's five links for you to utilize right there. Thank you for your attention. This ends Dhamma on air number 45. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Worthy Honorable And perfectly Perfectly Self-enlightened Was the best Buddha And have A nice Day You heard Bhikkhu Samaita from the Cypress Hermitage on the Knuckles Mountain, Pamparella, Central Hill Country, Sri Lanka. Please subscribe to the Google group Buddha Direct and visit the website whatbuddhasit.net. May all beings become thus happy thereby. Thank you. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha.